Hello everybody, second time. This is official start of our Cyphercast. Today my guest is Lucian Lipinski, the Olof, and we will talk about different things as usually connected with cybersecurity. Uh, our today's meeting is a little different than others because we have few slides for you, but I think that this meeting will be interesting for everybody. So maybe at the beginning I would like to introduce Lucian and Lucian will tell something about himself. Thank you, Shemek. Um, yes, I've been doing cybersecurity for uh, a couple of decades, um, primarily in financial services with some of the largest uh, global uh, banks and uh, retail institutions. And today I want to talk about um, very practical activities that uh, people can take to make them safer. So cybersecurity leaders and vendors and other speakers often talk about how to be safe, sometimes in very theoretical ways. But the th things I want to talk about today are practical activities that you can take today to be safer after this webinar. These are things that you can do so that this evening your attack surface is reduced and you're less likely to be a victim of an attack. So many people listening today will think that some of these are very obvious and um, are things that everyone knows. But I'll tell you right now that many of the things I'm going to talk about are still gaps in even the largest uh, global enterprises. And they still struggle with these five must do um, activities to remain safe. So um, let's go to the first slide, Shemek. And uh, really the, the main uh, activities we're gonna talk about today is minimizing admin rights, the extended permissions that let um, special activities and functions be performed. Some new topics on passwords and leading practices and do's and don'ts use of multi-factor authentication across the board, both inside companies and outside, maintaining software to reduce your potential risk to um, any malicious activities, including uh, key loggers, uh, some talk about emails and attachments that should be obvious, and then um, how to continue to uh, keep yourself up to date and educated. And then we'll also have some discussion about um, encrypting communications, which is also important with a couple of surprises in there as well. So let's, let's talk right now about minimizing admin rights, not just in the corporate environment, but also in your personal environment. So you should remove admin rights from all users, even the administrators. And this is true in the corporate environment, and also your personal devices. You should have uh, two accounts on your personal devices, one that is a standard user that can't install software. And then you should have another device, uh, an, another account specifically for doing um, activities that require elevated permissions. This is to keep malware off your machine uh, with, without admin rights, unexpected software can't be installed or run. It'll also help your computer run smoothly, be more stable, have a longer lifespan by not accidentally creating or changing file systems that are part of the system. This will also keep protections in force. So by accident, you won't turn off your firewalls or malware scanners. And it can also help keep home networks and corporate networks and other devices clean because one device on that network that gets compromised can then potentially um, impact the entire network or other machines. So that other administrative account on a personal device would be used to install software and do other tasks like applying patches. In the corporate environment, you should be using tools that uh, pass the Windows security token uh, to a particular process and only do that for processes and software that are on an approved list. Uh, there are other tools that also can automatically change the admin password every 24 hours. So uh, administrators who do have to have uh, special permissions use a new 
a strong password every day. And you can even set those passwords, those admin passwords to be different for every machine in an environment. So this creates an environment where the majority of malware can't be installed uh, because everything is running as a standard account. The other uh, way that this is less of an impact is software should be installed for an individual or for the user, not for the machine. I'm seeing a lot of corporate environments where the standard practice is to install software for a machine. When that's done, then uh, anything to change the configuration, patch that software requires admin rights. So just removing those um, uh, practices of installing software for a machine rather than the user uh, drastically limits the impact of getting rid of admin rights. So let's talk about passwords. So this will seem really intuitive, and, and I hope there are a couple of surprises here, but you should not be using your work email addresses for anything personal online, social media, shopping, anything. You, you want to separate the two. So that, that's going to keep uh, corporate environments safer, and it will also keep your personal uh, environment safer. Don't use the same password on any one site. So everything should be different. So that way, if a particular environment is breached, it doesn't impact everything um, uh, that you're doing online. One es estimate I, I read recently said that 90% of enterprise login traffic is basically credential stuffing. So what that means is stolen usernames and passwords uh, are being attempted across the board on retail sites, social media sites. And um, the top three areas where this is happening is retail and e-commerce, video streaming, social media entertainment, and financial services. So those stolen credentials will just be blasted with all those stolen usernames and passwords. And surprisingly, there's some, there's some hits. But by not using the same password across more than one site, you drastically reduce your potential impact to credential stuffing. Um, you'd be surprised about the password. So uh, at the end of last year, um, one firm listed the top five passwords that they saw. Sadly to, to say, number one is password. The second most commonly used password is one, two, three, four, five, six. The next is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sorry, it went up to nine this year. Guest and QWERTY. Um, you'd be surprised that all the passwords less than 10, character, uh, 10 characters in length have been cracked. Now, what do I mean by that? The way that passwords are secured in almost all environments is by applying some algorithm called hashing. And hashing is a one-way algorithm, and it's impossible to go backwards. But what some sites have done, and there's one in, in particular um, uh, called Project Rainbow Crack, they have literally figured out by crowdsourcing um, every hash of passwords up to 10 characters, including uppercase, lowercase numbers, and special characters. So when you hear about these breaches where credentials have been stolen and they say, well, don't worry, all of the passwords have been hashed and secured, there are tables where you can look up that hash and find out what that password is. Again, having a strong password longer than 10 characters and not using it on more than one site protect you against that risk. Um, the new technology, the, the new research also shows that really the best passwords are those that are th roughly three five letter words, uh, five three letter words, something like that, just unrelated words. You don't even have to worry about uppercase, lowercase numbers, or special characters, unless, of course, the site requires that. But there is a great standard that you can read uh, about that in the US. It's, it's the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, or NIST, their publication 863-3, and it talks about what they found about 
what makes passwords secure, and part of that is not having to write them down. And there's also a great uh, US FBI video about passphrases and multi-factor authentication as part of um, the FBI's Protected Voices series, and that's that's good to um, uh, watch and, and learn from. And let's, Shemek, let's go to the next um, screen. Now that I've mentioned multi-factor authentication, you should be using multi-factor authentication on all your accounts and services. Wherever possible, it adds an extra layer of security to all your accounts. And it, this typically um, involves prof, uh, providing some second form of verification. It can be an app on your phone. Um, SMS messages are typically not uh, a strong MFA approach, in particular because uh, some threat actors can um, uh, social media their way in uh, <laughs> social engineer their way to your uh, mobile phone provider and get the account swapped to um, their SIM card. And then when they try to attack you because they've gotten your username and password, those SMS messages go to their phone, not yours. So it's much better to use something like a biometric, your face, uh, a thumbprint, um, uh, an app on your phone where you have to see a, a, a six digit number that regenerates every 30 to 60 seconds. Now, um, this will significantly reduce your risk of unauthorized access. And you should go to all your financial services sites to anything having to do um, with your corporate environment. And you should see where MFA is available and you should apply it across the board. Let's go to the next slide, Shemek, because while MFA does provide risk, Many people think that it is free from attack, but it's not. Um, there are uh, approaches that people are using such as um, authentication fatigue. And that's when you keep getting these uh, MFA requests because someone's trying to get into your account and it might happen even two, three o'clock in the morning while you're sleeping and you just might accidentally or on purpose just because you wanted to stop, hit the approve and now you've been um, compromised. I talked about the SIM swapping. Uh, so what you want to do to prevent that is uh, contact your mobile phone provider. And at least here in the States, you can lock down uh, your accounts to make it difficult to change to a new phone or changing um, SIMs. Uh, so just don't put your guard down because you've applied MFA to your uh, various um, authentication uh, approaches to your um, websites. And then there can be man in the middle attacks. So these are uh, sophisticated attackers who can actually intercept the communication between you and your sophisticated uh, and, and your legitimate services. And they can then relay those codes uh, to authenticate themselves and gain unauthorized access to target accounts. And quite honestly, there are many other ways um, that those attacks can take place against MFA. Let's move ahead and talk about software. So you have to update software to the most recent releases and versions. One of the reasons why software releases come out these days is because security holes and vulnerabilities have been identified. So it's very important to only use the most current releases of software. If you're using a package that is no longer supported, you should look for a replacement. Even smart, uh, technical, security-minded individuals can get attacked by failing to keep this in mind. A matter of fact, one very prominent uh, attack that involved um, uh, a password vault company. The reason that they got compromised because one of their tech, uh, senior technical architects was working on a home machine with back level software that had a vulnerability that the threat actors 
attacked, took advantage of, and then was able to compromise the uh, data of users of that product. So as I mentioned before, you should install the software for users, not for the machine. So this way it's much easier to maintain and upgrade uh, software. Most software updates are to close those security vulnerabilities. So you should, whenever you get this request to upgrade or to apply a patch, you should. You should every uh, Tuesday when Microsoft comes up with these huge amount of patches, yes, apply them. Make sure that's automatic. For businesses, you need to make sure that you have a complete inventory of all your software and their versions and what's installed throughout the enterprise. That can be a huge daunting um, exercise, but it's important so that you know what is current, what is back level and what you should possibly force an, uh, 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 an uninstall of. That leads me to anything that is being used with a cracked license or downloaded serial keys, you really have to remove it and uninstall it. The majority of that software contains key loggers. Two prominent ones are the Russian password stealer and the raccoon stealer. And I'm seeing a lot of corporate and individual credentials being sold on the dark web. And because most of those passwords were less than 10 characters, those are critical postings because the username and password have been uh, shown in clear text. And that goes back to what I said in the beginning. If you use that same combination of email or username and password on more than one site, then all of those sites that use those credentials have been compromised. Matter of fact, an article was saying recently that the Russian password stealer, uh, stealer has stolen more than 50 million passwords in 111 countries. So this is a very, very broad risk that I wouldn't be surprised is on uh, a number of the machines of people who are attending today. You should make sure that your browsers are always kept up to date. You'll see that um, uh, Google Chrome, for example, will have a number of uh, critical security and urgent updates uh, that, that get pushed whenever you start your browser and you should shut it down and restart it at least every couple of days to let those automatic patches get applied. And those current browsers offer many protections to stop you from going to malicious sites and downloading uh, risky software. You should heed those warnings. If something says this is a risky site, don't try to circumvent that and go to that site anyway. So let's talk about what should be pretty obvious. So if you get an email, you shouldn't click on any links or any of the attachments. That seems pretty obvious. But I'm going to encourage you to be cautious about even those messages you get from people who you know. Were their machines compromised? Is that really the email address that the message is coming from? So you really should be cautious. And uh, the best thing would be to uh, call, certainly don't reply to the email and say, hey, did you send this? Is this okay? You know, ask, did you just send me an email with a link? Is this the attachment? <clears throat> uh, is the attachment something I should open? And uh, one way that I've been able to uh, get very successful phishing uh, tests through. For example, in the US around Halloween, having an email that looks like it's coming from the HR department talking about what's appropriate in terms of costumes or behavior around Halloween. And if you want to see the full, uh, the full policy, click here. Gets almost everyone. Same thing with uh, the, the free coffee shop or the, the free Starbucks coupon gets people all the time. No one is going to give you anything free. I guarantee it. You've not won the lottery. You're not going to get a free display or iPhone. Um, 
business email compromise attacks doubled between 2021 and 2022. These are huge um, approaches to uh, compromising environments because once you are in that environment in an email, you've now been able to get around a lot of the securities that are um, protecting the perimeter of the network of a company. And because most companies let their employees have admin rights, now when that link is clicked, that malware can be activated and run because that user has the ability to install software. So that gets back to uh, what we were saying earlier, remove admin rights and protect yourself. Um, tools such as ChatGPT and other of the literally hundreds of other AI tools are just going to make this risk greater and make identifying fraudulent messages and email harder. They're going to come up with ways that um, the messages can be uh, customized, be more aligned to your interests, uh, your activities, um, your, your online usage. So it, it really is a good practice to not click on anything and make that the, the uh, habit. And if you're getting all this spam and you, you think that you want to uh, stop it by clicking on unsubscribe, Doing that basically tells the sender, ah, this is a valid email address. This person potentially could be a target. So it might very well encourage more activity if it's not from a legitimate sender. Um, and that unsubscribe button, if it's not a legitimate email, may very well be a way to install malware. Shemek, uh, I know I've been talking for a bit. Anything you want to add in this before I continue on? Yep, please continue. We have time. <laughs> Thank you. So you've, you've got to keep current because the uh, security environment literally changes every day. And while many people don't see themselves as technologists, you have to know what's going on in this interconnected world now in terms of the latest security practices. So threats and attack techniques are constantly evolving. You have to know about the latest trends and vulnerabilities, especially with your um, home internet of things or IOT devices. It will help you make informed decisions and take proactive steps to protect yourself and the organizations you work with. And read um, reliable sources such as security blogs, uh, industry publications, and official security advisories. It's very good to subscribe to those. They come out almost on a daily basis. And sometimes it can be a little bit numbing, but, but some of those, especially if you're in security roles, give you the way that you can identify um, signatures of attacks, so to speak. And those are called uh, indicators of attack or IOA and indicators of compromise, IOC. And you can apply that knowledge um, to your environments in the corporate world. Additionally, consider participating in security awareness training. There's some good classes. Uh, there's some good courses online that you can take from a variety of sites. Um, attend webinars like this to enhance your knowledge and understanding of potential risks. So let's just quickly go back and realize that remove admin rights from your machines, make another account on your personal devices, make that an admin um, uh, level account, make your normal day-to-day -day account uh, uh, standard um, so that you can't accidentally install software change your password practices, make your passwords wherever you can, 11 characters or greater. Don't reuse passwords on any uh, sites. Every site should have its own password. Use a password vault or password keeper to be able to manage those. 
Um, implement multi-factor authentication everywhere you have the opportunity to. Make sure that all of your software is up to date and current and it's legitimate software. It hasn't been downloaded from uh, other than a vendor site and you're not using cracked software. I mean, you might think you're saving money and, and um, that's all good until your bank account gets drained. Uh, be cautious with emails, really start to trust no one and educate yourself. But there's one more thing that is, is really important and Shemek, let's, let's move ahead. And that is uh, applying an additional level of security through encryption on uh, your messaging. People are surprised when I talk to them and mention um, that if you read the terms of use or the terms of, of service and you know, those little things that you always click and say, accept, you really should read those because it, it'll be an eye-opening and educating experience for you. Some of those cloud service providers in some of the levels of their contracts, such as um, uh, Google and Microsoft in their um, email and collabor uh, collaboration environments, Google Workspaces and Microsoft's 065, some of their contracts and agreements have basically said that they have access to your private encryption keys. And if contacted by the government, they will respond and provide copies of your communications in clear text at that point. And they don't necessarily have to let you know that that's taking place. So you want to be looking at encryption in what's called a zero trust model. And that's basically kind of what I was talking about with the emails and messaging. You have to only trust yourself. And so in a zero trust model, you have your keys. And so when the email is stored somewhere else in the cloud or um, uh, you're using data that's uh, stored on a cloud drive, you put another level of encryption where you own the keys and no one else can um, uh, change that encrypted data to clear text. That improves your uh, confidentiality. And we're seeing more and more attacks these days where uh, data is, is being stolen and companies are sometimes exposing their private keys. And you can look online and see how some top vendors have exposed their private keys that basically are the ways to unencrypt everything. But if that data has been encrypted at another level with your own keys, you don't have to worry when those type of breaches um, occur. Shemek, do you want to add um, about encryption and, and maybe show us what you do? Yes, uh, I think that the best way to understand how uh, how encryption works is to show you how CypherDoc is, is working. But maybe before that, uh, I think this is a good time for uh, entering question in chat. So I, I see the first question uh, from Ken, who is asking how to how to protect passwords when you have six email passwords and then it seems some businesses medically have portals with more passwords so many passwords maybe you can answer russian well, for that. sure sure and and of course what i've said earlier on makes it even worse if i'm saying that on the and people are surprised at how many different sites they go to on uh, possibly hundreds of sites or um uh applications and tools they use. How do you manage that? You'll notice that browsers uh, do have uh, an ability to um, save and remember passwords and sometimes uh, enter them uh, themselves. I'm not a huge fan of that, but then they have password vaults and there are a number on the market and those will save your credentials, your username, the password, the site you're going to. You're the only one who actually has those credentials. The one that I use, I actually can protect with biometrics. And it syncs up across uh, all of my devices. So if I'm going to a site on my desktop, it remembers those credentials. And then if I go to the same site on my phone later, it has transferred those credentials in an encrypted approach 
that um, enables me to go on my phone or any of the other devices. And I also can uh, create uh, collections of sites and credentials that I can share with my family members, such as our streaming media services or um, uh, some of our e-commerce retail sites that we share as a family. I hope that answered the question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lucian. And I, I see, for example, that uh, last uh, last week I, I checked my password manager and I saw that I use about 350 different services uh, with different passwords. I hope, yes, because I, I know that is very important. Uh, so this is good time for asking questions, but uh, at this moment I will show you CypherDoc. This is excellent tool uh, for encryption. And this, uh, this tool is zero uh, trust model. So the best way to understand how it works is show you. So uh, CypherDoc is a tool uh, which allows users to encrypt any text or any file and share or send it by any media. It means that we can use, for example, email, we can use cloud storage, we can use any messenger chat, what we are, why. So uh, this application, this is the small poll you can find here. And during installation process, this application is creating pair of key, keys. One is public and one is private. This private key is always on your device and we as CypherDoc and nobody else has access to them. It is protected by password too. And public key, uh, which application used for encryption is stored in cloud, but uh, before sending on our server, this public key is signed by certificate of user. And we always have uh, uh, have knowledge that it couldn't be changed by hackers, for example. And how it works, this is not, not so hard. Uh, so many people think that uh, using encryption is complicated, but frankly speaking, if we see on CypherDoc, it's not, because we can use and write emails, for example, and uh, we can uh, create an email to my other account. This is uh, at other domain subject. It could be test. So I can use uh, a question of can as a message. I can use this message two times or three times. And I would like to encrypt only part of uh, this message, not all. So I select it, right click, encrypt message. And after a few milliseconds, I have uh, text encrypted. So I can send it on my second mailbox. I click send and I would like to check it uh, on my other mailbox, which I have on Thunderbeard. This is another email client. So get messages. I should wait one second or more. Yes, you can find that this is new email test. I can open it and you can see uh, that uh, two paragraphs are not encrypted, but the last one is encrypted. How I can read it? Easy, just click and you can see that the third line was encrypted. Very similar way I can encrypt uh, emails uh, in Outlook. Yes, because this is the most popular uh, native client of email. And how to do it is easy uh, as before, but we have other, other method because we have additional button here in Ribbon. So we should click here and after confirmation, and you can see that this text is encrypted. And if somebody steal your email and or have access to your mailbox, for him, this uh, cipher text is garbage. <laughs> This person without private key, which we use for decryption, uh, cannot read it. And another way is how we can encrypt files. It's easy too. Uh, you can see that this is my secret uh, folder with two files. And for example, this one, May Harpoon, is our CypherDoc partnership agreement. I can encrypt using right click encrypt with CypherDoc and I should choose user for whom I will encrypt this file because I should show application which public key uh, this application should use. So I can 
encrypt for one recipient or more because we are using both methods both algorithms of encryption symmetric and asymmetric so we can use additional one address i can choose five uh, from the um, from the list to add more than one or use drag and drop if i want and choose the destination folder click or encrypt and after a few milliseconds you can see that this file is encrypted and this file you can send the method you want for example you can send it as attachment to email you can send it uh, using we transfer because we have guarantee that only person for whom was encrypted can decrypt them nobody else we can send this uh, file using uh, for example, Slack, we can send this uh, file using other methods, we can share on Google Drive, and if somebody has access to file but haven't private key for decryption, have no possibility to read the original content. How to decrypt is easy, uh, similar to encryption. I just should double click and you can see that this file, this one was decrypted in this moment. So. What to do if uh, you are using some, uh, for example, um, web client or on a client, email client, which is not supported directly by CypherDoc, is easy because in uh, our application, there is option for encrypting text, for example, and you can choose uh, my other email as example, and for example, send credentials to user to be sure that uh, this, uh, this content will be protected. After entering text, I can click encrypt. And at this moment, you can see that there is information that uh, cipher text is in uh, clipboard. And what can I do? I can send it by any way. Which way? For example, I can use, you can imagine, very popular Slack. So I can send this way. And what happened if I select it and receiver will select it, can decrypt them using the same method. And it's decrypted. But I have very good information for everybody because we just developed uh, plugins for uh, Microsoft Edge and uh, Google Chrome, which allows you encrypt and decrypt any content uh, which you have in different HTML applications. So it means that we cooperate at this moment with desktop uh, Twitter, with desktop Messenger from Facebook, with desktop version of WhatsApp and other email uh, web clients. So um, I think that uh, uh, next week will be official launch and you can check it. Uh, going on our website. I think it, it was quite interesting. So I will go back to, uh, to, to our conversation because I see that there is a, another question. So I see a question from Gosia uh, who is asking what is better, asymmetric or symmetric encryption? Could you answer, Gosia? Yes, so symmetric encryption basically means that there is um, one key. So that means, Shemek, you and I would share the same key. I could encrypt something. You, would, you could decrypt it using the same secret. The problem is that um, once that gets out, anyone could decrypt everything that we have. The asymmetric encryption means that I have a secret I don't tell anyone. That's my private key. I can share then with anyone my public key. So you want to send me a message, you can encrypt it with the public key, but then only I can decrypt it. You can't even decrypt it with the public key. So once encrypted, the other method is the only way to decrypt it. So um, sending something that has been uh, encrypted with a private key, with a public key, you don't have to worry about other people with the public key being able to change that from cipher text to clear text. Now, the trade-off is that the asymmetric encryption and decryption process takes a lot of overhead 
And so the use of different encryption approaches, such as when you do web browsing and so forth, is this trade-off between how long do we need to keep some information a secret and then how strong does that secret need to be uh, protected? So one uses a single key to encrypt and decrypt, and another uses two keys, a public one and a private key, to encrypt and decrypt. Did I answer your question? I think yes. Uh, so I uh, I see a question from Kate uh, Katarzyna uh, about uh, about antivirus system and backup, do, which we recommend. I think that there is a lot of different and good uh, antivirus system, but the the most important is at this moment not use Kaspersky because uh, Kaspersky has uh, Russian roots, and this is true and confirmed conf confirmed info. There is a lot of different good software like Sophos, Trend Micro, Iset. What do you want? I use Acronis from Backup Tool. So if we talk about backup, there is a lot of different uh, vendors, but we should think about what we would like to backup because uh, one point is uh, backup of endpoints. Second thing is backup of uh, server virtual machine so in personal use i use acronis what about your experiences Lucia? um I, I i don't want to necessarily recommend products but i will say that um uh the the ones that come with the operating system uh have been getting stronger and stronger so um uh those are very good it, it, it pays to do some, some research. Likewise, I see a, a question about there about password managers I can, uh, I recommend. Uh, what, I what I would propose is look out there and don't select the ones that have been in the news lately because they've been uh, breached or lost information. Um, <clears throat> but uh, do look at how they work and uh, the different capabilities and functions they provide, and does it give you the capabilities you need across your, your systems? I see another <clears throat> question about if a vault and a password manager um, are the same. They're, they're becoming more, the, the term is pretty much um, uh, similar now. It used to be a little different. One was pretty much just keeping the passwords in a file or, or something similar, but now they're really locked down because it was uh, recognized pretty quickly that if you don't encrypt and apply zero trust and some type of security to that vault um, and you lose that vault password or that vault password gets compromised, then all your passwords are at, uh, at risk. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong and matter of fact it's better if you have as the question here is one password manager for certain business applications and one for personal <clears throat> i'm a big proponent of keeping personal and business separate that also provides you with an additional level of what's called defense in depth where you've now made it so that if one of those password managers is compromised or you you lose the um, confidentiality of those passwords, it's not impacting everything business and personal. So splitting that up is always a, a good um, a good practice. I, I will say that every time you do something that makes you more secure or increases your protections, it makes it a little bit harder to use and a little bit less attractive user experience. Um, I happen to prefer using uh, for my um, anti-malware and my uh, password vault, I think it is it is cheap insurance. So I actually use the uh, paid versions in part because they offer um, more sharing, uh, more capabilities. And I often think, okay, if my machine was compromised or if I got um, malware, wouldn't I probably think in my head, oh, if I yeah, if I threw $200 at this to make this problem go away, I would do it. Well, do that before you run into trouble, not afterwards. I don't know if there's so much a problem with the uh, free ones. They're basically the same technology. You're just not getting as rich an experience and as 
much functionality. I hope I answered that question. Shall I think that yes, yes, it's it's okay. So I see that somebody somebody is typing. I hope that I think that it could be the last question. No, this is thank you. So uh, somebody else is typing. So maybe it, uh, it will be next question. But at the end, because we are going to finish uh, our meeting, maybe at the end you have uh, additional few advices for all people who attended our event. Uh, being secure uh, really has to be done in an active manner. You can't be passive about this. The uh, really, and you have to give them credit, the brilliance of these nation state actors and attackers um, has to be acknowledged. And because of that, you have to uh, really play an active role in how you keep yourself online. And some people I know even go to the level of having uh, a sim another simple laptop that they only turn on and strictly use, not even for email, just for their online financial activities. But um, Shamik, I do want to say uh, I love this series. I think that um, there's a lot to learn in uh, these webinars that you run. And I want to thank you for inviting me here today. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Lucian, for attending. And I would like to invite all, all of, uh, of you uh, for our uh, next uh, Cyphercast, which will take place in two weeks um, on the same time. And we will talk with uh, Krzysztof Konieczny, who is the owner of company, uh, which prepared virtual re reality trainings uh, about cybersecurity. So I think it's, it's very interesting because uh, I try to use it and it's much better and much uh, more interesting than uh, standard presentation and other things because this is a kind of game. So uh, I would like to invite you next for the next event and uh, uh, thank you, Lucian, for, for today's event. Bye.